The next thing we need to do is discuss something that cells do very routinely, and that is protein synthesis. In order to understand protein synthesis, we have to go back and review some of the basic characteristics of DNA and RNA. Recall that in its final uh, configuration, DNA is a double-stranded molecule consisting of two strands of linked nucleotides that are held together along the sides by bonds that connect the phosphates and, and sugar molecules. The nitrogen containing bases stick off to the one side. The two strands of DNA are held together as the two nitrogen containing bases link up and form a ladder-like structure where the sides of the ladder represent the linked sugars and phosphate groups and the rungs of the ladder represent the nitrogen containing bases. You may remember that in DNA there are four basic nucleotides that are defined by the, which nitrogen containing base the nucleotide contains. These four nucleotides are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. When the DNA molecule pairs up in a double-stranded molecule, the adenines, or A's, always pair up with the thymines, or T's, and the cytosines, or C's, always pair up with the guanines, or the G's. RNA is made up in a similar fashion to DNA, with the exception that the sugar molecule that makes up the backbone of this of uh, RNA is slightly different from the sugar that's found in DNA. In addition to that, one of the nitrogen containing bases that forms the nucleotide is slightly different. So while A's, T's, G's, and C's were used in building DNA, in RNA the T is replaced by a molecule known as uracil. And so the four bases that make up RNA are A, U, G, and C. During protein synthesis, there are two major events that are going to occur. The first is known as transcription. During this stage of protein synthesis, which occurs within the nucleus of the cell, a portion of the DNA that contains the recipe or code for making a protein is going to be unzipped by a specific enzyme. Unzipping literally means that it's going to break apart the two strands of DNA, which leaves the nitrogen containing bases exposed. A second enzyme known as an RNA polymerase will attach to the DNA strand and begin to create a complementary strand to the unpaired DNA strand. But it will pair the DNA strand with RNA bases. This RNA polymerase will continue moving down the DNA strand, making this complementary um, strand of RNA until it reaches the end of the code sequence or the end of this recipe. At that point the RNA molecule will fall off and the DNA strand will reconnect again and go back to its original shape and configuration. The resulting RNA copy that was made is now known as mRNA. The mRNA molecule will be shuttled from the nucleus out through one of the nuclear pores and into the cytoplasm of the cell where it will encounter the machinery that's going to do the next step of the process. The second step of protein synthesis is known as translation. In this particular stage of protein synthesis, we're going to change from a nucleotide sequence and use that information to create an amino acid sequence, a completely different type of molecule. This is done with the help of the ribosomes. The ribosome attaches to this strand of mRNA and will begin to read the mRNA um, almost like a long tape 
um, with letters on it. The ribosome will read the RNA strand three nucleotides at a time. These three nucleotide sequences are referred to as codons, and they can be thought of almost as like words. Within the ribosome, there are two sites that will hold a carrier molecule known as a tRNA. tRNAs are like mRNAs in that they are composed of nucle nucleic acids, but their specific job is to act as a shuttle or carrier for amino acids. Often these tRNA molecules are represented as small clover leaf looking molecules that have a portion of the RNA poking off to the inferior part or downward and that will usually consist of three nucleotides and on the opposite side of the molecule is a region that is specific for holding amino acids. Now the portion on the bottom that has the three exposed nucleotides is referred to as the anticodon and the job of the ribosome is to find the right tRNA molecule that has the correct anticodon sequence to match the codon sequence that it's currently reading. Once it finds the tRNA molecule that is a match to the codon, it puts the tRNA into position. Then it moves to the second codon in the mRNA strand and finds another tRNA that matches that particular codon sequence. Once it finds this one, it moves it into position. Now keep in mind, at the top of each of these tRNA molecules are the amino acids that each tRNA carries. Once the ribosome has both of them into position, it will move the amino acid from the first tRNA molecule and attach it to the amino acid of the second tRNA molecule. The first tRNA now is empty it no longer possesses an amino acid on its top and the ribosome kicks it out and moves down the RNA strand one codon sequence. Then it looks for another tRNA that has the matching anticodon sequence and puts it into position and then moves the two amino acids that were attached to the other tRNA and attaches them to the next tRNA. Then it kicks out the tRNA that's in the first position and moves down another codon sequence. You can imagine as this continues, as the R ribosome continues to move down the mRNA molecule and brings in tRNAs and attaches more and more amino acids, the amino acid chain will lengthen. Because each tRNA possesses a specific anticodon sequence and the tRNA that possesses that anticodon sequence only carries one kind of amino acid. The sequence of codons in the RNA strand dictate which amino acids will be put into the amino acid chain and in, in, what, in what pattern they are going to be connected. So that the mRNA sequence ultimately dictates the amino acid sequence. So the ribosome will continue to move down the RNA strand until it gets to the end, at which point it will encounter a codon sequence that indicates the end of the recipe. It's referred to as a stop codon. The protein is going to then be taken to another part of the cell where it will be folded and eventually packaged for use elsewhere. If you ask most people on the street and say, why is it that we need to eat, they will say, well, we, need, we get energy from the food that we eat. And that's true to some extent. Much of the food we eat does contain energy 
that allows us to continue to live. But a, another important reason why we eat is so that we can get the building blocks that we need to build and maintain our bodies. When you eat a protein, for example, like a steak, you're ingesting a large protein. Your body takes that protein and eventually digests it into individual amino acids. The individual amino acids are carried into the interior of your cell where they then can be available for your cell to build new proteins. Eat. The end result of protein synthesis, of course, is going to be the production of some new protein that your body may need. And if you think about the different roles that we've talked about that proteins play, uh, for example, some proteins were um, channels, some proteins were markers in cell membranes, some proteins were enzymes, some proteins were receptors, some proteins were there for um, building cytoskeleton of cells, um, and, and the list can go on and on and on. This is where these proteins come from. The cell builds the machinery, the proteins that it needs, through this process of protein synthesis. And the recipe for building every, each and every protein that your body needs is found in the DNA of your nucleus of the cell.